Let me just read you this one passage from the Dead Sea Scrolls, not Worm's translation, but my translation. Oh, I just got that yesterday. Which? This one here? Yeah, this is really good stuff. Um, of the Damascus document, which I think is a very good translation, obviously. This is addressed, by the way, to the knowers of righteousness. And that God has a dispute with all flesh and will do just justice. Will do righteousness. And they had a covenant with the first, and he left a remnant, a remnant in Ezekiel. Did not deliver them up to be destroyed at the time of the first wrath, then when the king of Nebuchadnezzar came, and so on, the first, the first destruction of the first temple. And then, in line 7, he visited them, as I told you last time, a visit. Who visited them? God visited them. Well, if God visited them, it's very much like the Gospels portray God visiting Mary. But I don't think God visited Mary to uh, have a Gre Greco-Roman sort of uh, romance festival and procreate a child. Uh, not in this document, anyway. That's more like what uh, we see in... Uh, Greek mythology, uh, Zeus is always running around with human maidens and from getting, uh, you know, demigods and titans and all these kinds of individuals. No, God visited them and caused a root of planting to grow. And it's singular for all those who think there's a dual um, uh, Messiah at Qumran. It's singular. To grow from Israel and from Aaron, single thing. To inherit his land and prosper on the good things of his earth. And they understood their sinfulness, and they knew that they were sinners, that is, remission of sins. They were, they were, they were called upon to, uh, to uh, uh, make atonement for sin. They understood they were sinners. And they were like blind men groping for the way for 20 years, and God considered their works, works righteousness, not faith. And because they saw him with a whole heart, watch the heart image, and he raised them up up for them a teacher of righteousness to guide them in the way of his heart. And what the teacher of righteousness does is guide the community in the way of God's heart. And he made known to the last generations, our time, the present time, the time this is written in, which they consider to be the last times, what he would do in the last generation. But notice that uh, the teacher of righteousness guides them, guides them in the way of God's heart. Okay? Now, we've read that, all right? Now, in chapter 15, as you recall, of, of Matthew, chapter 7 of Mark, Mark, in, in fact, is a little more extensive in, in this particular instance. Usually, Mark is more um, uh, compressed. But in this instance, Mark is what we, Mark is more prolix. It's not parallel in uh, John or, uh, or Luke. So, you see, you really can't tell the relationship of the Gospels, where a thing is going to come, uh, 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 pop up in Luke, Mark, or Matthew, and when Mark is going to uh, you know, be more extensive, but when the other is going to be less, and so on. But um, this starts off, and I'll repeat it, that came to, uh, to Jesus from Jerusalem, Pharisees and scribes, says Matthew, and says Mark there, and they're gathered unto him Pharisees, and some uh, are certain of the scribes which had come from Jerusalem. This is a, uh, an epitome or a uh, reflection or a retrospection project or a retrospective projection backwards of the sum from Jerusalem coming down to question Paul and Cephas and Barnabas about table fellowship with Gentiles. That is what I submit to you. I don't have to believe me. It's going on here. And uh, we discussed it last time why I think that. But notice how we have the, um, the uh, emphasis on the person here writing this material is a, my view, a person from Hellenistic background, a follower of Paul, and uh, someone who's using historical episodes to write his version or her version or his theological approach into the teaching of the master teacher, Jesus, whose name means salvation itself. Jesus in Hebrew meaning salvation. This is my approach. You don't mean you have to accept this. Look, we know the normative approach. You say, well, this is my approach. It's, it's the normative approach, yes, that we believe exactly what's written here. I understand that. We don't have to keep beating that horse. Everyone knows that particular position. We've heard it for 2,000 years. I mean, we're going to keep hearing it for 2,500 years without hearing anything 
that might uh, say something slightly different. Uh, we know the, uh, don't say we don't know the orthodox approach. If anyone doesn't know the orthodox approach, read the book. So we don't need to say, well, you know, I don't agree with that. Okay, I understand. I'm not saying you should. I want to throw out a challenge to you to think and consider what is actually going on, and that's why this has been so difficult to penetrate. You know, you say, why haven't people previously penetrated? I told you one of the reasons is they didn't have the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, to give them uh, the material, um, they didn't have the Dead Sea Scroll to show them what a Palestinian, authentic Palestinian, messianic, apocalyptic, militant movement would look like. So how would they know what something different might look like? How could they penetrate this? But you see, now we have had, for the last 50 years, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in my view, for the last 25, we're getting some decent uh, um, uh, evaluations of the scrolls, in-depth uh, literary, not just considering the handwriting or, or some you know, superficial, external uh, way of approaching the materials, but looking at what the scrolls actually say, we're getting some, you know, in-depth understanding of what the scrolls are about. I read you that passage from the scrolls uh, to begin with on purpose. So, um, let's see. So, let me get this over here if I can. Uh, I guess I probably, I'm going to move this thing because I have it pointed a little bit uh, in the wrong direction. There we go. Uh, so I'm sitting over here, so I have it put in the wrong place. Um, in any event, so let's just, because it's easier to spread these things out here. <coughs> so, according to, um, remember, the sum from James come down, and in Mark we actually have the sum. Now, I told you that Pharisees often and scribes from Jerusalem are not always Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem in the historical sense. They sometimes reflect the Jerusalem church who are looked upon as Pharisees. Acts says in the introduction to the, in the, introduction to the Jerusalem council, Acts 15, um, it says, some Pharisees came down to Antioch and taught the brothers that unless you were circumcised you could not be saved. And that triggered uh, Paul going up to Jerusalem to put his version of the good news before the so-called Jerusalem Council. And James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the early churches, appears for the first time authentically there without any introduction. So we've already heard in Galatians 2 that the party of the circumcision is James. So the some insisting on circumcision who come down to Antioch are the party of James. They're not just some old Jews from any old place. They're Jews within the movement. Why would uh, anyone outside the movement care what's happening in the, uh, in the Christian church or whatever you want to call it in Antioch? I don't think that they particularly do. The people that care about this are the ones in the so-called movement or what I would call the Messianic movement. <laughs> well, this is another one. And um, they saw that some of the disciples ate bread with defiled hands that are unwashed. That is, they weren't keeping uh, purity regulations. Remember when uh, Paul says to uh, Peter, you know, in Galatians 2 again, previously you were willing to eat with the Gentiles, meaning they didn't wash their hands and things like that. And so you weren't keeping purity regulations. But when the sum from James came down, or the party of the circumcision, you withdrew, and Barnabas copied you in this hypocrisy. Barnabas parted from me and went with the James party. I've read to that now three or four times, so you're, that's probably the most important passage in the whole New Testament for understanding what is going on in the early history of the church. And so if you haven't read Galatians 1 and 2, which we all and all of 1 Corinthians. Romans is harder to understand, but you can plug the materials in Romans into Galatians and 1 Corinthians pretty easily. It's a little more um, guarded. It's like Paul is aware that someone is uh, watching what he's writing, and he's a little more careful in how he expresses himself. So anyway, just giving you a possible, I don't say you have to agree with this, I'm just giving you a possible understanding of what's going on here. Okay? 
So, um, you remember, so then uh, I also told you that episode where um, Augustine wrote Jerome in the 5th century. Jerome was where? Jerome is the real orthodox leader of the early church uh, intellectual cadre. Jerome lives in the late 300 or early 400s. He's functioning in Bethlehem. He's gone there from Italy. He's uh, an Italian uh, Christian individual who's gone to Bethlehem and he works on manuscripts like a monk. And he's there for 40 or 50 years collecting manuscripts. He's seen Dead Sea Scroll material, I think. And he also compiles his version of the Latin Vulgate. He's the one responsible for the Vulgate that the Catholic Church uses to this day. He's a very intellectual, a very intelligent person. So Augustine is a new Christian, come in from Manichaeism in North Africa, and he writes Jerome in one of his letters, and we have a copy of that letter. He says, uh, like any new person not understanding some of these matters, he says to Jerome, how dare Paul call the holy and saintly Peter a hypocrite? Well, you know, that's, Paul's pretty aggressive. I mean, I was kidding with my wife the other night, uh, you know, I mean, you know, we speak of charity, love. You know, I've been on a lot of uh, radio interviews for my book. And people call in and just keep on saying love, 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 love. Okay, I, we all love. We all want to love. But then they have this uh, this apostle here who's actually not full of any love whatsoever. And, you know, he's full of aggression, anger, a lot of hatred. I think jealousy, vindictiveness, and he certainly doesn't love his enemies. <laughs> he doesn't love his enemies. He does anything he does, can do to undermine any people opposing him within the movement. And uh, he hasn't got an ounce of, uh, of human feeling for those who oppose him whatsoever. In fact, in, 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 I, I don't mean to be cruel about this, and I know, and my wife and I just marvel that people think this is a saint. And, and, but that's the point. When a person becomes a saint in the second century or third century uh, AD, and remains a saint for 1,800 years, no one 2,100 years later thinks to question anymore. Because first of all, they don't read his writings themselves, they filter it through the second and third party. So they, even if they saw something upsetting in his writing, they would be like, oh, look, here. Well, hey, am I missing something here? And then they would promptly go and forget it. They say, well, everyone says Paul's the same wonderful person. Therefore, I, he, he must have been. Now, why did anyone question this? And the same with Eusebius. Eusebius is Constantine's bishop. I've told you this several times now, but if you didn't read him yourself, you guys have, I think, in your other classes. Uh, if you didn't read him yourself, you wouldn't know this about him. He is full of hatred, anger, and vindictiveness. There is not an ounce of love in this person. You know, so, I mean, when I hear people <laughs> talk about charity, love, uh, you know, loving your enemies, and so on. Oh, these are noble thoughts. But none of these uh, early founders of the church as we know it ever embodied them. You say, well, they fall short. We all, we're all sinners. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. But you read the first book of Eusebius. He revels in the people of Jerusalem eating their children. He loves it. He thought, oh, this is their payback for their crimes against our Savior. And he just, you know, dwells on it with such, you know, thrilling, uh, a bloodthirsty joy that it really is repulsive. That's all I can say. Sorry to get carried away here, but that is what is there. And then people say, oh, this is, no, and that's why I say any true Christian, anyone who really cared, anyone who loved Jesus would want to get to the bottom of some of these issues that have caused the kind of killing, inquisitions, murder, burnings, and final holocausts that we've seen over the last 2,000 years. I don't say Christianity is bad at all. It's a beautiful doctrine. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, essence and the richness of the whole uh, 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 Greco-Hellenistic Roman prayer, the highest form of behavior embodied in this uh, God-man individual. That's fine. But if it's got these kernels of other things floating around in it, you know, um, like uh, if it has some some evil demons there floating around in it, then any good Christian would want to get rid of these things and would want to find out what they are and, 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 and you know, purify uh, 
So if there's, if you love all mankind but you hate one people, well, I don't think you, and it, in fact, if it's the Lord's person, people themselves, and they've gone through every hell you can imagine, uh, from inquisitions to holocaust and burning, then I know that there's something that has to be done there. And, uh, and I'm sure he would expect it. And certainly, and I'm sure that if he were alive today, he would say to some of these people, I do not know you. <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan, or whatever he's pictured as saying in these Gospels. He would say it as sure as I'm standing here today. And this is one of the sections he would say it. And that's why I'm so incensed and tense about it. Because here you see what they're doing here. Uh, they're all worked up. And the reason I know it's not a Jewish person writing this is because the Jewish person just accepts that, you know, you uh, wash your hands uh, before eating. It's part of the, uh, you know, mosaic uh, um, uh, oral legal uh, tradition. And it was just, and these people know that that's what they did. But these people were not Jews who were writing this. And they thought that those, uh, that those uh, kind of uh, behavior patterns were weird. Now these are Greco-Romans. So well, what are these guys uh, washing their hands for? Just because they just went out to the bathroom or something like that? Well, we're not to wash your hands. Uh, you know, our ancestors did. And that's what this is about. I told you last time. Some of his disciples ate their bread with unwashed head. And the Pharisees and all the Jews, see, they know that. See, you can see that this is not Jews writing this because they're telling you know, they're acting like they're outside looking in. It wouldn't be a Jew who say, uh, the Pharisees and all the Jews. They would say, you know, uh, we. We hold that, you know, you don't do this. You wouldn't say the Pharisees and all the Jews. That means Jesus isn't a Jew here. If you follow me. I mean, it's just written right through that this is written by a Greek Hellenistic convert, probably of the Pauline variety. Now that's how I do history, and that's how I do tradition research, I may be wrong. Anyway, except they wash their hands diligently, eat not, holding the tradition of the, of the elders. Now anyone who knows the tradition of the elders, knows that that's a book in the Talmud called the Pirkei Avot, the tradition of the elders. It's a famous book in the Talmud about the transmission of the a mosaic uh, a legal uh, uh, in, in instructions in the oral manner. It's called the Pirkei Avot. That is a uh, Aramaic name. Pirkei Avot is uh, traditions of the elders, the fathers. This is talking about the Pirkei Avot. I have to swing back and forth here because it's so. You have the two side by side here. Yeah, it's so important here. Okay. Uh, you see, I'm going back here to Matthew. Uh, so Jesus' answer here is, why do you also transgress the other commandments? So we're having polemics here, you see? This is Greek dialectic now, you see? Okay, you wise guys. You want people to eat with, uh, with uh, washed hands? Don't you have another commandment? So we're here in a room arguing, you see what I mean? You have another commandment, like, you know... Uh, you are not us. You are the Jews. You Jews. You have another commandment, or you Jamesian party you within the church. You Judaizers, as Acts calls them. You have another commandment from God in your tradition. Did you forget it? You see, again, yours, not mine. God said, honor your father and your mother. And he that speaketh evil of his father and mother, mother die a death. I don't know. I mean, that's probably from the Moses Ten Commandments. I don't know if it's that verbatim about dying a death there. That wherewith thou mightest have been profited by me is given to God, and he shall not honor his father. And ye have made void the word of God because of your tradition. I know it's hard to follow. But what he's saying is that Many of our fathers, or your fathers, didn't wash their hands. And therefore, your, uh, your, your, your tradition has, because you say you should wash your hands before eating and so on, you have made a void, a tradition, to honor your father and your mother. Now, that's what I think is being said here. So, you see, again, this is directed at the New Gentile uh, community. Someone of a polling saying, it's not like, don't worry about these Jewish dietary regulations. I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't. I mean, this is a, a totally abstract discussion here. 
I don't wash my hands always before I go to eat, I have to be honest with you. And, uh, I, you know, I don't keep kosher uh, rules and things like that. So don't think I have an axe to grind here. I don't. In fact, they get on my nerves too. But uh, that isn't the point. The point is, what is going on at this time? It, it doesn't matter whether you and I agree with this. Isn't that right? We're not doing theology here and modern behavior. You do what you think. You don't want to eat uh, uh, barbecued uh, hamburgers at the beach dripping in blood. Done. If you like, uh, if you like lobster, do. You know, that's, not, that's nothing to do with me. You don't want to wash your hands before eating? You think your hands are clean enough? Don't. That's fine by me. You, you know, but we know what these people thought. You know, and I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't. It's nothing to do with preaching. It's doing history. So, this person is saying, let's see if Mark makes it any clean, clean, uh, cleaner. And when they come from them, the marketplace, notice that Paul in Corinthians said, eat all food sold in the marketplace. Do not uh, make distinctions on the basis of dietary regulations. For me, uh, there are no forbidden things. This is, he says this uh, twice in 1 Corinthians between uh, 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 chapter 6 to 11. You can check me out. It's certainly there. I don't want to run over to it. But this is Mark, you see it's more detailed. Except they, uh, they eat not, and many things there be which they have received to hold, where washing cups, pots, vessels. And the Pharisees and the scribes, Why walk ye not your disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their food with defiled hands? And Jesus says back, quoting Isaiah, You hypocrites! Well, there it is, right from Galatians. That is what Paul called... Peter and uh, and um, and um, Barnabas, you got it. It's giving all the evidence right here. But if you are not very insightful, you'd never see it. And you know what? It took me 30 years to see it. I only saw it when I was writing my most recent book, and I didn't even see it at that time until I started looking at this every plant which my heavenly. That's why I'm taking a lot of time on this past. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be uprooted. I didn't even see that passage, by the way, hypocrites. Uh, who's got a pen? I want to mark it. <laughs> uh, give me an extra one. I've got an extra pen. Pen. Let me. Okay. Thanks. I don't know if you can see how important this stuff is. I mean, it is like bedrock. And uh, I don't like to be into self praise. But uh, I'll take a little bit of uh, credit for having discovered it, if you want to call it a discovery or not. And I'll show you how bedrock it is in a moment, because it shows the whole modus operandi of how the gospel writers are working. And what we show they're working off in an extremely effective way. And I'm not saying they're not clever, intelligent men. They're very clever, intelligent men. And, but I, I would submit to you, and you know I think this, it has nothing whatever to do with the historical of Jesus at all. It has to do with polemics between the James party in the church and the Paul party in the church. Between the new Gentile converts and the so-called Pharisees or some from Jerusalem or the Jerusalem church or the party of the circumcision or the Ebionites, whatever you want to call them. All right, now let's see, where does that tell you? <laughs> let's see, um, hypocrites there, it's hypocrites, okay, Mark. Let me go over to what, 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 what number of markers I want to whip over. That's the problem of having a regular gospel and uh, having a... What? What is it? 7-6. Seven, 7-6, seven, 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 okay. I, want to, I just want to get it here marked in this, because if I don't mark it in here, uh, Mark 7-6, uh, hypocrites, 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 okay, hypocrites, yeah, hypocrites, okay. I had it marked, actually, but I uh, marked it again. Okay. So, you have to read both, you see. But the Mark is just piling on Matthew, isn't it? Uh, frankly, I think in this case, Matthew is the earlier version, and the Mark version is adding detail. Whoever the writer of the Mark is, is getting is very excited and wants to, you know, throw in more material on this, on, on this subject. Uh, that's why I say the interrelations of people think well, there's an early gospel, a later gospel, so on. The, 
they, they bounce back and forth in such a complex way that I, I don't even think it's possible to say which came first. And people say John is different. No, sometimes John agrees with Luke. And I hope I'll be able to show you where John actually agrees with Luke. The, the relationships are so complicated, I, I, it would take a, almost a space science to determine, space science to determine what, uh, you know, which came first. But in vain, so he's using a different argument to some extent here. He's not saying honor your father and your mother. That's what contradicts eating with unwashed hands or eating with washed hands and the pirkei about. Um, he's saying um, uh, uh, all this other material like, um, uh, anyway. He's quoting Isaiah. Their heart is, 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 is far from it. Uh, you leave the commandment of God and hold fast to the traditions of the elders. I don't know here in Mark what the commandment of God is. And he said unto them, Full well do you reject the commandment of God, that you keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor, there, he's saying, Honor your father and mother. And he that speaketh evil of his father and mother, let him die a death. But he said, If a man say to his father and mother, that wherefore thou mightest have been prophet of me is, uh, is forbidden, that is say, or, or is holy, that is say, given to God. You no longer suffer him to do aught, I don't, making void the word of God by your tradition, which ye delivered, and many such like things ye do. Do, 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 doing an attack on the doers, on the Jamesians, I think. Well, anyway, if you follow that, and it's hard to follow, basically, he's saying, your fathers and mothers should be honored. Since they didn't do this, why should you? But the Jews, fathers and mothers, did, uh, theoretically, we assume. So this is aimed at the new and Gentile converts. And then he's saying that, a, uh, that a, uh, a, a prescription from the Mosaic Law tops this one, because this is only a tradition of the fathers from the Talmud, or something like that. So all of this is really heady stuff. But let's, uh, let's go back here. So we haven't ended here. Let's go back over to Matthew. Then Matthew 10 picks up this material, and he called to him the multitude. By the way, the rank and file of the Dead Sea community, as some of you have already pointed out, are known as the many, the rabbi. Okay? So, we did this last time, but let's do it again. Hear and understand. Okay, and hear now, all ye knowers of righteousness. And understand the works of God. That's the first line in, the, in, in this Damascus document that I just read. And <laughs> well, here now, all you know is of righteousness. He has to dispute with the flesh and so on and so forth. Later on in column two. Uh, and now listen to me, all you enter the con, con, uh, confident. I will unstop your ears. We'll have a lot of unstopping of ears in the, the pictures of Jesus and some of the... Uh, one miracle he does, he spits in someone's ear, or spits in their eye, and then, yeah, he spits in their ear. So their ears will be unstopped. I think all this plays off the language here in the, in, in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You say, well, why didn't people see it previously? They didn't have the scrolls. They don't understand where some of these things were. I mean, I don't think my God spits in people's ears to unstop them, but uh, if your God does, I'll, you know, I defer to it. I'm not going to argue with you on that point. No God that I know spits in people's ears. And no God that I know, frankly, tells people to eat with unwashed hands. You want to get a commandment of men? That's a commandment of men that I've ever heard of. That is someone who is not doing science. That is someone who is living in Rome, Athens, or Alexandria, who doesn't like Jewish dietary laws. Not that Jewish dietary laws are marvelous, but they did have some basic health understanding that are were superior or to some extent you know, more insightful uh, in, uh, than others in that time. They understood that blood was a problem, a serious problem, that we have not even understood until today how serious blood is. Now people in hospitals go around afraid to touch anyone who's bleeding or doing anything. They all have gloves on. You go to your dentist, the dentist won't even come near your mouth without a pair of gloves on. They're all petrified of getting AIDS. You know, and I don't think AIDS just popped out of the woodwork yesterday. Hepatitis too. Huh? Hepatitis also. Yeah. So these things. So I'm saying I'm not saying that the Jewish. Diet, I'm saying I think the Jewish dietary laws were based on some long-term uh, observation, science, if you like, 
of certain problems that emerge from certain behavior patterns and did their best through taboos, very primitive taboos, I uh, 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 agreed to avoid some of these things. One thing, of course, was the problem of uh, germs in unwashed hands. Another thing is the problem of blood, sleeping with women in their periods or consuming blood, blood of animals, any kind of blood of any kind, putting women outside the camp during the menstrual flow, all those things. I'm not saying they were wonderful things, and I don't say they did them all the time, but the law understood there was a problem there. It wasn't they were just being mean. You know, they saw the health, the health issues, and I think circumcision too, though it was obviously a symbolic thing that the Egyptians were already practicing it. Uh, but they were in a um, society, and I'm not uh, putting down or, or, or raising up anyone who is or is not on this issue. That's a matter of parents, and here we do have honoring the father and the mother and uh, so on and so forth, or the tradition of the elders. But circumcision, I'm not talking about female circumcision in here, which is absolutely, obviously, a horrendously horrifying thing and should be prosecuted to the nth degree, and someone is being prosecuted for that here in America. Something happened in one of the families here, uh, a man, I think down in Georgia, an immigrant uh, uh, family of some kind, circumcised his daughter at the age of uh, 12 or something. Uh, just a horrendous thing, and uh, they're prosecuting that person. Uh, I think a uh, very serious prosecution going on on that particular issue, uh, because he did it himself, he didn't go to a doctor and stuff like that, just a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, in any event, um, and, and, and a horrible thing to do to any woman, period, you know, to, uh, to um, uh, desensitize a woman in that way, it's just uh, <laughs> utmost stupidity, and yet it's done in large swaths of the world still from, uh, you know, Afghanistan down into Africa, so uh, yeah, it's really uh, a serious one. But circumcision of the other kind that we know about if you're living in a society where you don't have ready showers and ready, uh, ready, uh, um, you know, access to uh, bathing facilities and uh, you know uh, uh, things that uh, are so uh, materials that are uh, effective in uh, uh, dealing with uh, germ situations. That is an area of the body which can become easily infected and infect others in a tremendously uh, frightening manner. It has to be, you know, you have to have a, a health situation so very well in hand in order to control that. So I, I have no doubt that the circumcision was the uh, was the way that they originally chose to, uh, to deal. I'm not talking about female circumcision. I'm talking about male. Uh, uh, to deal with it if in modern health uh, situation, I don't think uh, that's a big issue, frankly. Uh, you know, uh, but all of you know what the issues are there, and I believe it to you guys. <laughs> to sort of that. So I, I, again, I think most of these prescriptions in the law at that time had to do with probably a very early appreciation of health, health, health matters. I may be uh, wrong here. I, I, you, uh, then they, uh, uh, you know, I may be an apologist over apology here, and, and you'll have to judge that. But I think they were based on health matters on the whole, and like, uh, for instance, they wouldn't eat carrion, uh, food that died of itself, food that wasn't slaughtered, you know, they wouldn't eat, uh, you know, a beast that actually ate other beasts. All these are health things. All these have to do with appreciation of, 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 the, of the consequences of, of embarking on that kind of activity. Um, and the seafood itself, today we have refrigeration. But we know, I mean, geez, I don't know if you've ever eaten a bad clam. I have, man, and you know, you, and you're talking about hepatitis. I mean, you can get sick for several weeks, uh, if not permanently, from something like that. But that hasn't been refrigerated or something properly, etc. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they were doing this, uh, you know, and they had, you know, bottom feeders, all that kind of stuff. Only eat the fish with fins and scales, they say. You know, that were not bottom feeders, not eels, not, you know, all these other kinds of things, and so on. Well, you know, I don't want to get into the health things, but on this particular matter, um, the tradition of the fathers is eating, they, he ends up having Jesus tell his followers not to wash their hands, or not necessary to wash their hands before eating. Now, all of us know that that is not the historical Jesus. Uh, every one of us knows, because if Jesus is a super, superhuman being, 
He knows better. That's my view. Now, you can attack me on that if you're not. But let's go further. So anyway, so, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is, and I think I'm probably the first person ever pointed this material out. I don't know why people are so frightened to do any of this, to any talk any sense. I mean, where's Spinoza? Where's Rousseau? Where's all these great uh, skeptics and everyone on these issues? I haven't seen one mention any of these things. They, too, are frightened to death of getting, you know, tacked up on the cross and burned or something like that. You know, uh, uh, I haven't seen anyone. Where they just reject everything, but they don't get down to into specifics, the right and the wrong things to keep and not to keep, uh, and they don't do the historical Jesus. Okay, so uh, hear and understand: not that which entered the mouth defileth the man, but that which proceeded out of the mouth this defileth the man. Now that's really good polemics, and I think we all love that statement. We love we love that statement. So, you know, stop making problems about food, as Paul says. The main thing is your foul mouth, what you say, and your bad feelings. And we like that. I mean, that's a favorite, favorite, favorite parable or whatever you want to say. Now, but look at what follows it, as we said last time. Then came the disciples. So we know the issue here is table fellowship, dietary regulations, keeping table fellowship, the whole, the same issue we've had in, in uh, Galatians 2. Then came the disciples and said unto him, uh, notice how the Pharisees are offended when they heard you saying this? The Pharisees, you see, the clean hands people, the dietary laws, the James party, the some from Jerusalem who came down to Antioch, codenamed Pharisees, the Pharisees in Acts 15. These are, that's why I call my book the New Testament Code. The codes that exist here. Uh, uh, but he has to said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be uprooted. And of course, that's this here. That shows they know that the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he visited them and caused a root of planting to grow. It even has the root here. Shall be uprooted. So, the root of planting. To my mind, this is the Essene, extreme Essene groups. This is the James party. That party shall be uprooted. Because it wasn't planted by my heavenly Father. To my mind, this is a direct attack on the, on the Damascus document. They said, come on, Eisenman, where do you get off with that stupid idea? I don't think it's so stupid. But how would anyone know it 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago? They wouldn't, because they didn't have the Damascus document. These people did. They knew it was in the Damascus document. They knew about the new covenant in the land of, of, of Damascus. That's the whole point about my, uh, about my book. And they were transforming it in the way that we're seeing it here through the portrait of Jesus here in the scripture. Now you're, you have to, as I said in the pseudo, from the pseudo-Clementines, determine false coin from true. And you have to be like good money changers. Uh, that's the quote in the pseudo-Clementines from Jesus, determine false coin from true. I don't want to call anything false or true. You have to decide for yourself, but I know one thing is not true. Jesus never said, don't wash your hands before eating. Not my Jesus, and I don't know about your Jesus. And if your pastor says something else, ask him about that. See what his Jesus is. And how he explains this away. What was Jerome's answer to Augustine? On how can the how can Paul call the holy and saintly Peter a hypocrite? Jerome said something like a year later, we have his response. There are some things uh, left uninvestigated. And I'm sure that's how the pastor or anyone else would uh, respond to this more or less. Jerome is a very intelligent man, clever man. He just sets it aside. He doesn't want to go there. Did you ever see that interview with Mel Gibson and Diane Sawyer? Where Mel, uh, Diane Sawyer is asking Mel about his father being a Holocaust denier. And uh, Mel says, don't go there, Diane. Don't go there. And Diane didn't go there. <laughs> Jerome is saying, don't go there, Diane. Don't go there. <laughs> there are some things that should left uninvestigated. Now, you guys, if I've told you, you, if you parrot or, or explain or come out with any of the views that we're discussing in this class, anywhere else, you'll get crucified. So 
So I advise you to be very circumspect in how you approach these, not because you should hold back or anything, if you think they're correct or incorrect, or you don't have to even agree with them to uh, throw them out there. Just be careful, because people who haven't looked at the materials just don't understand what you're talking about. Haven't got a clue. So let's do the final thing that we did last time, but it's really worth uh, doing here. Remember, we read, and God considered their works, and they were like blind men groping for the way, and so on and so forth. And he raised up a teacher of righteousness to guide them in the way of his heart. What comes next here after every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be uprooted? The implication here of this plant in the Damascus document, they say, well, Eisman, how do you know it's this plant? Maybe they're saying this plant's okay, it's some other plant. Maybe they agree with the Damascus document. I know they don't agree with the Damascus document because they don't want you to observe purity regulations. The Damascus document says the new covenant of the land of Damascus is to set up the holy things according to their precise specifications. The holy things are these purity regulations. Where you have in uh, Josephus' picture of Essenes, uh, the two love commandments, loving God, the piety commandment, loving uh, your fellow man, the righteousness commandment. And under uh, the piety commandment, loving God, he has the Essenes put all these purity regulations, bathing every day, uh, special food, special meals, and so on and so forth. These are the purity regulations under expressed under piety towards God. So, um, you know, we know both the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls people, and probably the James group, if uh, Galatians is any indication, when their son from James came down from Jerusalem, Peter and Barnabas, whose habit previously was to keep cable fellowship with Gentiles, withdrew. And Paul said, how come you do this hypocrisy? Why are you hypocrites? And then he repeats it when he says, and Barnabas copied Peter in this hypocrisy. Okay. Now, so the teacher of righteousness that is raised up to guide them they were like blind men, right, groping for the way. And the teacher of righteousness was raised up to guide them in the way of his heart. I did this last time, but I repeat it. Look at Matthew. No, this is not in Mark. So you see these two sw things swing back and forth on, on how they operate. Let them alone, the so-called Pharisees from Jerusalem. They are blind guides. There we have it. The blind leaving the blind. And they were like blind men groping for the way. That's the very next sentence in the Damascus document. I don't think that sounds accidental. See why I think this is so important? This is a sequence of things that shows what is in the mind of the writer and it also explains how he's working on these materials. Sorry to make such a big thing of this. Uh, I, uh, I'm doing it for the purpose of those who weren't here last night, time because I think it's so important and for you to reemphasize it doesn't, uh, doesn't hurt. And then guide them. He raised up for them a teacher of righteousness to guide them in the way of his heart. He raised up a teacher. So this teacher of righteousness is full of rubbish, this document is saying. He isn't God. He's not the right God. And then it goes further. To see, uh, um, let them alone, they are blind guides. If the blind guide the blind, both shall fall into the pit. Right? And guess what we have coming along the Damascus document. I have it marked in my other book, I don't have it marked in this. The, 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 uh, the condemnation of the men of the pit. Using the exact same language about the pit. So, okay, I may be wrong there, but, uh, okay, that's, that's fine there. <coughs> and uh, Peter answered him and said unto him, uh, Declare unto us a parable. And now Jesus says, Are you still, don't you understand? And Peter is always the dumbo. He never understands anything. He falls in the water for lack of faith. That's because Peter is the swing figure in, in uh, Galatians. Peter in uh, Acts needs a... Um, a uh, heavenly vision to, to, from a tablecloth to uh, convince him that he can eat all impure food so that he can visit a Roman centurion. This is not Palestinian messages. This is Greco-Roman overseas messages. 
aimed at conciliating the Roman imperial authorities. That this is not a bad uh, movement we have here. This is a good movement, and I don't think it is a bad movement, except where it is infected by the strains of Greco-Roman and Pauline anti-Semitism that I think has been very deleterious, and I repeat it, the Lord's own people, Lord's own family, the Lord's own background, he would not permit this. He would not, he would not allow it. He would object to it. He would, he, he would, he would, he would put it behind him. He said, how can you speak in his name? I ought to speak in his name as much as these people dare speak in his name that he, that Jesus, would not allow such things. Uh, that's, that is, that is, my, and anyone who questions you on this, in your church or anywhere, just say that to them. That not the Son of God, not the epitome of all righteousness, he would not have this on his hands, not from his very own people. What, the Jews are the worst people in the world? And the Eskimos aren't? Just because they're not written out here in the book? I have nothing against Eskimos. But you would think from the history that the Jews are buying something like horrendous. It never ends, even with Holocaust. Now we want, the Iranians want to wipe them off the earth, and the whole Muslim world is shrieking for their blood. Where does this all come from? All this hatred, all this uh, vilification. Okay, literature, literature. Poet, uh, Plato said, don't let the poets in the, in the Republic. They, they weave the stories and the, what he considered the, the half-truths, in fact, he considered them lies, by which people live, that the poets deceive the people with these stories of gods and goddesses and all the uh, copulation of gods and goddesses and so on and so forth, and they should be barred from the Republic. The only people who should, should be in the Republic are the philosopher kings and their adherents, the people who uh, know how to uh, determine false going from true, who know what light is, who know what righteousness is and know what justice is and care about such things. That was Plato. I'm not saying he's the end all of all philosophy, but he didn't like what the poets did, the Greco-Roman poets he objected to. But, uh, I think uh, we know why. Now, perceive ye not that whatsoever goeth into the mouth, passeth in the belly, and out the toilet bowl. Matthew again. The thing which is out of the heart, come forth, mouth come forth out of the heart, and it is these things that devile the, the man. Noble thought. No, nothing to, to disagree with, nothing not to admire. For out of the heart comes for adulteries, fornications, thefts, rayings, and so on. These are the things to die or defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands, that does not defile the man. Well, that's now stretching things between defiling and making someone impure and uh, making someone guilty. I mean, that's uh, playing off the mis that's that's semantics now. But the fact of the matter is, is he's saying, the whole point then goes back to don't defile the man. And then, as we saw, Mark punctuates this. Perceive ye not that whatever goeth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it does not, it, it's not in his heart by the way. Notice the heart material there. I didn't notice that before. Uh, and God considered their works, because they sought him with a whole heart. There's the heart material there. And he raised up them a teacher right to guide them in the way of his heart. Heart, 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 here too. Uh, because it goes not into his heart, but into his belly and out the toilet drain. Thus he said, making, so Mark goes further, making all foods clean. And that's what Peter learns in Acts, and that's what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians. For me, there are no forbidden things. Okay. There's the food sacrificed to idols. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, um, I'll read you 1 Corinthians 8. I think it's, a, it's really incredible. Uh, I've read it once, but I'll read it again. This was probably worth taking uh, two periods on, or maybe it wasn't. But let's look at this 1 Corinthians 8. Now about things sacrificed to idols. Starts off right back. Where is things sacrificed to idols first mentioned? James instructs its overseas community, Acts 15, 21 and uh, 26, I'm going to show it to you. After, <laughs> why, these are all interconnected. Everything is interconnected. 
Look at Acts 15. And certain ones, some, there are certain ones, the certain ones of the uh, scribes or the Pharisees, came down from Judea, not from Jerusalem, but from Judea, teaching the brothers that unless you were circumcised according to the custom of Moses, there's the party of the circumcision, you could not be saved, the James party. So after an uproar had occurred, Barnabas, and with much discussion, appointed Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and certain others. Oh, and there it is, to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. Even the elders are here. I didn't even notice that one before. You just keep on popping new and new parallels. You know, it just bounces back and forth. You begin, you begin to get crazy, I admit. Say, Eisenman's crazy. Yeah, it does make you crazy. <coughs> you know, you see every word, you see something, and you don't know if it's a charged word or just an accident. But there's the elders there. Uh, <clears throat> and being, being set, see, if you read it out loud, you see it. If you just read it to yourself, you often don't. And they go down from Phoenicia and Samaria and cause great joy. And then come to Jerusalem. They were welcomed gladly by the church. And, and all the apostles, there's the elders again. And they revealed all that God had done for them. And there were certain now uh, 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 ones again, here are the certain ones, from the sect of the Pharisees who believed, who rose up and said, it's only right to circumcise, blah, 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 blah. And then the elders repeat it again. And then Peter makes his speech. Uh, then James makes his speech. By the way, line 16 of James's speech. And these things I will return and will build up the tabernacle of day David, which is fallen, and will build up the ruins, and I will set it up. And then we're talking about seeking out the Lord here. Go in the Damascus document here. It's all in the Damascus document, column 7. Um, and they who were steadfast escaped to the Lord of the land of the north. As God said, I will exile the tabernacle of your king and the bases of your statues from my tent in Damascus. The books of the Torah, these are the tabernacle of the king. As he said, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which is fallen. Exactly the same material here in the seventh, in the seventh column of the Damascus document. And then it goes on to, uh, uh, and then it says, in the base of the statues there, the prophet, uh, the books of the prophet, whose words Israel despised, and the star is the interpreter of the law, who came to Damascus, as it is written, a star shall go forth from Jacob and a scepter to rule the world, the star of prophecy, and so on and so forth. Now, let me see if I can show you the uh, falling into the pit material here. Uh, I think it's in, um, uh, or cursing the ones who are sons of the pit. This one, uh, column six. And um, they are to do according to the precise letter of the Torah in the era of wickedness, to separate from the sons of the pit, to keep away from, the same as we'll see in James's directive, uh, uh, based on the root, root NZR, Nazarite usage, keeping away from. Uh, uh, to keep away from, and we're going to have this now in James's directive, but there's the sons of the pit. Uh, from the riches of the temple and robbing the poor uh, and, um, of his people and uh, making widows a spoil or murdering orphans, but rather to separate, but here it is, separate between polluted and pure, distinguish from, between holy and profane. Just the opposite of what Peter learns in Acts 15. Just the opposite of the sense here. 180 degrees opposite. Well, I mean, every page is full of it. And then it says, to keep the day of the Sabbath according to the precise letter and the festivals and the day of fasting, Paul heaps abuse, as we know, on the festivals, according to the commandment of those entering the new covenant in the land of Damascus, to set up the holy things according to their precise specifications, to love each brother as himself, the royal law of scripture, according to James, which Paul applies to paying taxes to Rome. In Romans 13, it says you should love your neighbor as yourself, therefore you should pay taxes to the Roman authorities. <laughs> that is really like a, a very... Uh, it's not something that in Palestinian uh, environment would go down very well, that the love command was applied to ro loving the Roman authorities. In so, insofar as the whole thing was the tax issue in Palestine, causing war after war after war. Anyway, forget that. Um, so let's go back here to, uh, to Acts 15. So then uh, uh, we have the time. And finally, we have seeking out the Lord. Um, uh, we'll find, by the way, that we have this idea of seeking, seeking the Lord. And they sought Him with a whole heart. They were seeking the Lord with a whole heart. 
in uh, the Damascus document. And later on in that column 7, we're going to hear about the Doresh Torah, the secret of the Torah, which seems to be another, another name for the righteous teacher. Connected to all these prophecies in column 7 that I just told you about. Anyway, this is very complex material. I do it in my New Testament code in great detail. Not quickly like here in the lecture. Anyway, and the Gentiles on whom my name has been called, saith the Lord, who is doing these things, all his works are known to God from eternity. Therefore I judge, James talk, I rule. We are not to trouble those who turn to God from the Gentiles, but to write to them to keep themselves from pollutions of the idols, fornication, strangled things, and blood. And then later on he, he deputizes some people to take this down in a letter. Uh, it says here, line 29, Therefore, it is good uh, uh, for you to abstain from things sacrificed to idols, blood, strangle things, and fornications. That's line 29. And then in Acts 21, when Paul comes up to Jerusalem and has his last confrontation with uh, James, remember, line 25, he says to Paul, uh, those of the Gentiles we have written judging that they observe no such thing only to keep themselves from things sacrificed to idols, blood, strangled things, and, pure, and, 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 and fornication, right? So now we know what James is insisting on. I, whether that is the real James or not, we'll have to determine some other time. But I told you that in the testimony of Hippolytus about the Essenes, those he calls Sakari Essenes, extremist Essenes, who will kill anyone they see observing the law who is not circumcised, part of the circumcision again. These extremist Essenes, whom I think are represented by the Dead Sea Scroll materials, good or bad, I'm not advocating them, I'm just telling you what I think. These extremist Essenes are willing to undergo any torture, any, any suffering, any, uh, any threat of death, rather than eat things sacrificed to idols. Josephus only said forbidden things, but Hippolytus has things sacrificed to idols, which to my mind is more incisive. So here we go to Paul. Let's finish up with Paul, Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. You have to sort of juggle all these uh, things in your, in your hand. Now, about things sacrificed to idols. Shall we agree that they're all talking about the same thing now? Can anyone not agree to that? Now we're going to get Paul's view of it, which is, in my view, as you know, I always think this, and I, 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 I don't make any, any uh, you know, bones. Or, I, I, I apologize on the one hand, but don't make any apologies on the other for thinking that. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge. Gnosis, actually, in Greek. And it is gnosis here. But, you know, knowledge puffs up. These people with all this knowledge who are saying all these things, they're all puffed up with themselves. Or immediately, he shows no respect for people who are demanding these things. And we know who's demanding these things now. The extremist Essenes, the James Party, and so on. The leaders. Uh, but love builds up. Where's their love? Yeah, I don't agree. Where's your love? You know, <laughs> love, it builds up. A building imagery is very important in Paul, as it is in the Habakkuk commentary in the condemnation of the spouter of lying, who built a community on lying, they said. Yeah, Paul loves the building imagery. He starts with building imagery in the beginning of 1 Corinthians, about the, a building built by God, of which he is the architect. But if anyone thinks he knows anyone, here's his um, Greek ode usage of, <coughs> um, um, I, I said it last time, um, strophe, antistrophe, and epoch. See, he started off with uh, knowing and uh, know that we all have knowledge, but if anyone thinks he knows anything, has not known anything, as he ought to know, there's the antistrophe. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him, there's the epoch. Or if you like, in logical terms, it's thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is how Paul argues all the time. It's Greek rhetorical argument. He's very well trained in Greek rhetoric. He's been to the schools. He's had so Socratic, sophistic teachers, and he knows the Greek ode. It's not Hebrew argument here. It's very impressive. That's why people are like overwhelmed by it, and have been for 20 centuries. Okay, so he plays with that word no until your head is spinning. 
and he finally ends up where he wants to go. Where does he want to go? And is not, and, and therefore these people are not known by God. These big shots who have all this knowledge, who, 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 uh, who uh, insist on these things, they're not known by God. What was the Damascus document dedicated to? The knowers of righteousness. Those who know righteousness and understand the works of God. They're nothing, these people. Don't listen to them. That's what he's basically saying beneath the line. And so, but you know, you have to be neutral towards Paul and not love him to begin with in order to begin to see that. If you love Paul, well, you're just carried away by the, um, the splendor of uh, his, his uh, um, use of language. Uh, well, so now let's get to the, let's get to the meat here. Then, let's see, come on, line four again. Let, let eating things sacrificed to idols. Let's get it. We know. Here's the no again. Picks it up again. Even in English, you see, then I was nothing in the world. Well, they didn't think that. And I was nothing in the world. It doesn't exist. These people are making issues about nothing. Right off the bat, he's just like, he's not even willing to, to, to observe the, even the minimal Jamesian requirements. He's not even willing to obey the leadership in Jerusalem on one iota of anything. Nor is Jesus here. Because as Mark says, he did this making all food meats or foods clean. And uh, that's what the whole toilet bowl uh, imagery is about. And that's what Paul is going to conclude here too. Let's see how he does it. Okay. Again, he quotes, there is no God except the one. There is no God but Allah. There is no God except the one. I guess it's the, I don't know, you know, it's more like Islam, Allah, you know, but anyway. For even though there are those called gods in heavens and earth and many gods and lords, yet there is only one God, the Father of whom all things speak, and we for him, and the one Lord Jesus Christ, but whom all things, and we by him. Now that we're in the splendor of his, of his vocabulary, I'm not saying it's a, it isn't splendid, uh, you know, uh, captivating. Uh, it is. But let's get to what, he, what the point is after he finishes that uh, sort of quick. But this knowledge, you see, back to the knowledge thing that these big shots have, is not in all. But some, some, there's the sum, the sum from James, that's a leap motif. Some is always a loaded word. It's the Jerusalem church. The sum is always the Jerusalem church. Same in, in Acts 15. Some came down from Jerusalem. Some from James came. But you see, some, and now we get the sarcasm. I'm putting it in because I know it's there. Some being conscious of the idol, <clears throat> these people, you see, that's their problem in their minds. They've got a psychological problem. Eat as of a thing sacrificed to an idol. Here's the strophe and the strophe again. Conscious of the idol, eat as sacrificed to an idol, even until now. And their conscience being weak is defiled. You see, it's all about defiling. And this ends all the evil things received from within the man and defile the man. Their conscience is divine. Conscience is a euphemism in Paul for what? Observing the law. Conscience is, is a euphemism for observing the law. So these people eat. They're conscious of it. They got a, they got a mental problem. And they're weak. They're weaklings. Why? Because they depend upon the law of Moses. Now I don't say he's wrong now. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just saying he's nasty. I'm not saying he's wrong. He's not nice. You say, well, why should we be nice? We're fighting God's battles here. Okay. But we're supposed to love, love our enemies and respect our leadership. Supposedly. Anyway, so they're the final. But look here. So we know what he's talking about here. But look, meat, and again, that's it. We're from Mark. He said this, declaring all meat clean. Food or meat, it's the same word here. Uh, does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we better. Nor if we not eat, are we worse? This is exactly what Jesus is saying. This is this is Jesus' Paul now. And that's where this parable is coming from. So now let's go on. But be careful if this I know you're strong. And by the way, all through the Damascus document it's all about strength. I missed that one in my in my book. But uh, where's where's the pen you gave me? I've already lost it. <laughs> where, my kingdom for a pen. I missed the strength here. 
But why, uh, all through the Damascus document, it's talking about being strong and fortified and steadfast. Uh, but, uh, but be careful that this strength, talking to his community, of yours, does not become a stumbling block for the weaklings. I can hear Goebbels here. These weaklings, you know, and so on and so forth. Who, who are the weaklings here? The people who observe the law who need a crutch. Maybe that's true. But the point is the way he puts it. For if anyone sees you, you're the one who knowledge, you the every man, not these people in Jerusalem. They don't have any knowledge. Dining in an idle temper. Will not the weaklings, the weak ones, conscious, be uh, be wounded? So as then then he'll eat things sacrificed to idols too. He'll copy you. So this weakling will be upset because they're not strong like you. And through your knowledge, the knowledge we began with, this weak brother for whom Christ died will fall. <coughs> well, here's a little compassion. <coughs> but sitting in this way against the brothers and wounding their weak consciences, you are sitting against Christ. <coughs> so food causes my brother to stumble. I will never eat flesh meat again forever in order to in, in order that I may not cause my brother to stumble. Okay, so we say, so he's already said, I'm not going to eat meat again then because the weak brother, it will offend the weak brother, the vegetarian brothers. And in, uh, and in Romans, in case I didn't already tell you, but I'll tell you again, in Romans, uh, <coughs> uh, I don't know if I can find it quickly, where he's talking about stumbling in Romans 14, uh, throw down, do not throw down the work of God for the sake of food. All things are indeed pure, Romans uh, 14, 20. But is evil the man that stumbles, if not right to eat flesh, to drink wine, or do anything in which your brother stumbles or scandalizes? That's the same thing there. Um, but I can't find where he's saying. Oh, yeah, that's, but that's at the end of this whole thing. If one believes he may eat all things, 14 at the beginning, too. And others being weak, others being weak eat only vegetables. Others being weak eat only vegetables. The weaklings only are vegetarians. You guys are strong, you don't have to absorb over any of this stuff. Only the weaklings. Well, you know, if that's how you see vegetarians as weaklings, be my guest. Uh, we, uh, in fact, think of vegetarians very strong because they're willing to forego things that we want. Anyway, they're weaklings. Why are they weak? Because they're observing extreme dietary regulations. And they're uh, using the law as their crutch. They're Jamesians and other ones who are the weak. It's always an attack on the, on the leadership. Okay, so now we think he's being generous here. He's not. He's basically saying only when they're around because they have weak conscience, don't do these things. Uh, but after then about uh, arguing over um, uh, different things, he finally gives his method, line 22 of chapter 9. To the weak I became weak so that I might gain the weak. To all those I have become all things. Um, for being free of all myself, I became a slave, and mean a slave to the law, so that I might gather the most. I became as under the law, so that I might gain those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as outside the law. But not outside the law of Christ, that I might gain those outside to the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might gain the weak. Uh, and I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I might, and who shares it? Uh, so that no, no the one who runs the race really all run, but only the one receive, the, receives the prize, the winner. So therefore, run that, that you may win. Everyone tries to win in all things, but they really do it so they may win a crown that vanishes away, but we, one that will last forever. So then I do not run uncertainly, nor fight as one beating the air, using stadium athletics, which was abhorrent in Palestine. But I keep my body under discipline and bring it into yeah, in, in, under control, as I may be so by means some having uh, been rejected myself. That's how I fight, not beating the air. Well, look here. This is the first win philosophy, as I already told you. And he goes into that, but let's go to the next one. Chapter 10. So he starts on again about worshippers of idols in line 7 and fornication, which we all, which we all heard about in the instructions of James. And then finally, line 14, Therefore, dear beloved ones, flee from idol worship, back to the idol worship, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the body of Christ, communion with the body and blood of Christ, 
and so on. And look at the other Israel, the Israel according to the threats. Are not they the ones eating the sacrifice to share with the altar? That's why I say an idol is anything, or that which is offered as sacrifice is anything. No, these things are nothing. But the things that Gentiles, they sacrifice to demons. I agree, but I do not want you to share with demons. You cannot drink the Lord's cup in the cup of demons. Okay. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are, uh, for me, all things are lawful, uh, but not all things profit. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one pursue his own welfare, uh, but reach each of the others. Eat everything sold in the marketplace, in no way inquiring because of conscience. Um, then if anyone says that this is sacrificed to an idol, do not eat it for his sake, who showed it, and his conscience. And so on. Well, you know, this is so slippery. But what he's saying is everything is clean. Only when the people who make issues of these things are around, don't do it in front of them. I am a Greek to the Greek, a lawgiver to the lawgiver. You know, um, that's fine. And he goes on like that, but uh, he says at the beginning of all this that all things are clean. By the way, he says in the next chapter, does not even nature teach you it is a dishonor to uh, a, a man if he has long hair? Does not even nature say that it is a dishonor to a man if he has long hair? What do the Nazarites have in Palestine? They all have long hair. They don't cut their hair. What do the Romans do? They all cut their hair. So what is he ascribing to? The laws of nature. This is higher than the law of Moses, the law of nature, the law of the Roman Empire. Again. So again, you see, this is not a Palestinian doctrine here, I don't really think, and obviously it is more of an overseas doctrine. I'm not against it, but uh, as long as we understand uh, some of the things that are going on beneath the subject. Let me just last thing here in uh, 1 Corinthians, I didn't, uh, I didn't in, in chapter 6, before all this, he says, Line 611 in getting into this about uh, deceivers, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, murderers, and so on. And line 11. Some of the uh, of you were these things, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God. All things are lawful to me. But not all things do good. All things are lawful to me. Uh, now let me see how the Greek is there. If that is actually in the Greek, I, I, I guess it is. I thought it was, for me, there are no forbidden things. Anyway, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food is for the belly, and the belly is for food. There's the parable of Jesus again. So I think that this material in 1 Corinthians comes first. Jesus is being presented here on the basis of this. And uh, you say, well, there's nothing wrong with what Paul says there. Um, there would be in Palestine. And it is an attack on vegetarians. And it is an attack on things sacrificed to idols. It's telling his communities, you don't have to observe even, even that. And maybe you shouldn't. I don't really care about things sacrificed to idols. Okay. Uh, enough of that section. Let's uh, go on uh, next time, if you can get me out of this rut here. Uh, I want to go on where Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fishes. Uh, will you uh, make sure I got in, into that? Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Next time, Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes. After that, I definitely want to do the resurrection appearances and the empty tomb and things like that. So we be sure we cover all that material before we go back and then pick up other things that you might enjoy to talk about in the different See you.